spirit, we can understand it. And I ask, Lord, that you will grant us your spirit, open our eyes to see and ears to hear the truths that you have for us tonight. I know you have a blessing for each one of us. So may your word be clear and we should be blessed because we've chosen to be here this evening. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Okay, well, we, let's see here now. Hopefully this will get worse. It does. You remember a quiz last time? Yes. I'm going to give you the same one to start with real quick and see how you do if you remember from last time. You got a little piece of paper in front of you? You got a little card? Please put your name on it at the top. And these are true and false. It's a little review quiz. Uh, maybe, Patty, we need a few more of those. Raise your hand if you need one of these little cards. Okay, back here, over here. These are true and false. Oh, we're supposed to remember this from last week? Yeah. <laughs> a whole week. Oh, <laughs> no. Yeah, okay. So just put your name on the top. And we'll see how you did on remembering what we had last week. Okay. So you can number one through, I think there's five. And we're going to put a little bit. T or F, or write it out. So the first question, now, we had these last week, by the way, at the end of the class. So let's see what you remember there. The best way to interpret the symbols of Daniel and Revelation is to ask the various preachers what they think the symbols mean. True or false. Number two. The book of Daniel had, was written by the prophet Daniel during the 6th century B.C. True or false. Number three, the stories of the book of Daniel have nothing to do with the prophecies in the book of Daniel. The stories in the book have nothing to do with the prophecies in the book. True or false? Number four, a day in Bible prophecy is symbolic of one year, one little year in reality. So a day in Bible prophecy is a year, little year in reality. True or false? And the last one, the book of Daniel gives four parallel prophecies, each beginning in the time of Daniel, ending in the last days. So there are four prophecies in Daniel that parallel one another. They start in Daniel's prophecy and in his time to end days. Is that correct? Ending in the last days. Okay. Let's see how you did. Number one, best way to interpret the symbols of Daniel and Revelation is to ask the various preachers what they think. False. How do we learn what symbols mean? Let the Bible interpret the Bible. That's the key. The book of Daniel was written by the prophet Daniel during the 6th century B.C. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, B.C. That's when Babylon came in. Uh, number three, the stories of the book of Daniel have nothing to do with the prophecies of the book of Daniel. False. We learn a lot from the stories that have to do with prophecy. Number four, the day in Bible prophecies is symbolic of one little year. True. True. And number five, the book of Daniel gives four parallel prophecies, each beginning at the time of Daniel and ending at the last days. True. True. Good. Let me get them all. Very good. Very good. Okay, well... You know, it's so true, for every teaching in the Bible, yeah. Satan has a counterfeit. He's always trying to deceive, and that's why it's so important that we understand what the Bible prophecies teach. As we look, saw last week, there are a couple of different methods of interpreting, and we want to be sure we're following the right method, and again, letting the Bible interpret these symbols. That's the key. And whatever Satan counterfeits is going to be somewhat like the truth. Have you ever seen a counterfeit $3 bill? <laughs> Wouldn't fool anybody, would it? No. So he's got to counterfeit something that appears to be biblical, but it's not. And he'll mix a lot of truth with a little error. And that's how he can get us to it. But if we know the Word of God, we have nothing to fear. So we're going to get in our lesson tonight, The Cosmic Warfare of Daniel. And the theme of Daniel is the cosmic struggle between the forces of good and evil.
Let's go to this Ephesians text. It lays it out for us. Ephesians 6, 12. That's page 1720. Ephesians 6, 12. He says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So there is a cosmic conflict going on. You and I don't see the real forces. There's God's forces, Holy Spirit, the holy angels, and there are the evil forces. And that's what Paul's talking about here. So we may think, when you look at the news and you see this war, this country threatening this, that's flesh and blood, right? right? Now, yeah, they're talking and they're threatening this and that, but behind the evil is really Satan and his forces. That's and that's what he says here. We're, it's not just the flesh and blood. We're not really wrestling with them. No, it's against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And if you break these words down, you see kind of an organization. God is highly organized. If you just look in the world and the universe and things, mathematics, for instance, can describe everything, it seems. Well, Satan's organized too. So, you know, he's got his generals and captains and whatever, and, and they go out. And when you read this, that's what this is really referring to. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, uh, spiritual witness, high places. So he's well organized working against God and his people. However, as we'll see down the line in Revelation, when Satan fell, uh, he took a third of the angels. Well, God still has two thirds. So the majority is on our side. <laughs> it may not look like it in this whole world at this time. Now the God, great controversy is between the deliverer Christ and the villain Satan. That's what it's all about. And when we look at the book of Daniel, when the book of Daniel begins here, as the book of Daniel opens, who appears to be defeated? Let's go here to Daniel chapter 12, 1 and 2. I'm sorry, you're right. I'm still rattled from not getting started on that. Daniel 1. I tend to be a program-oriented program person. I like to start on time and try to end on time when it doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> then i got to settle down a little bit. Uh -huh. Okay. Daniel 1, verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So, as the book of Daniel opens, who appears to be defeated? King Jehoiakim and God's people. It appears they're defeated. But I want you to notice one thing in verse 2. And the Lord gave. See that? <laughs> Jehoiakim. It looks like Jehoiakim, I mean that Nebuchadnezzar was stronger. Yeah, he had a very powerful army. But if God didn't let it happen, it wouldn't have happened. But God allowed it to happen because of Israel's sin. They had turned away from God. So God couldn't bless now, as we go on to the next question, what ultimately happens to God's people? At first it looks like they're defeated, but then Daniel 12, now, Daniel 12, verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which stands for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be written, found in, written in the book. 
So in the end, we find God's people delivered. So it's kind of an interesting scenario through Daniel. It begins with God's people apparently defeated and going off into captivity. But in the end, God's people are totally delivered. Now as we move to the mighty deliverer, very important section, um, we, we find here, as we look at this third question, Nebuchadnezzar, and we're going to look at this in a study next time and time after, we're going to get into more detail, but to make the short story short, Nebuchadnezzar made an image and he wanted everyone to bow down to it. Now, we know in the Bible that there's nothing sinful about a statue or a picture, but God doesn't want us bowing down to them. That's the commandment, right? Don't make any images to bow down to. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're some of the captives taken from Jerusalem over to Babylon. They knew God's commandments, and they said, we can't do it. And the king said, well, if you don't, you're going to be thrown in the fiery furnace. And, uh, and, and but they said, we can't. And he, he, you get the impression, he gave them, a, you know, a chance. Uh, he didn't really want them, he respected them. He didn't really want to kill them, but what could he do? This was the decree he made. So, the soldiers took him to throw him in the furnace. The soldiers that went to put him in the furnace, they were killed. It was that hot. And these, these three men were in the furnace. And then, as the question asked, after Nebuchadnezzar cast Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace, how many people did he see in the fire? He put three in, right? But then he saw a fourth man. A fourth individual loose in there. And then we'll find out who that was. Who's this fourth one through the fire? Let's go over here to the text. Let's go to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel 3.25. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. <laughs> so he recognized the Son of God there. So Jesus was with them in this trial. Now, that's, that's something for us to remember, too. Christ does not always deliver us from having to go through a trial. We all have difficulties that we go through. But he goes through the trials with us. That's the beauty of it. And whatever he allows to come our way will work for our good. Let me, let me give you one text on that over in James chapter 1. That's way over in your New Testament, toward the end of your New Testament. I didn't write the page down. When somebody gets there, let's go to James chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse 2. And is somebody on the page number then? 1772. What is it? 1772. 1772. Page 1772. James 1, verse 2, 3, and 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Some translations will say trials. Same idea. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. You ever gone through a trying time to challenge your faith? Of course you have. We have in the past, maybe you are now, there will be some more in the future. That's how it is in this life. But he says here, when you do that, when you go through those, it says it works patience. That word patience is endurance. God wants us to learn to trust him, regardless what situation we're in. Like when those three Hebrews were thrown in the fiery furnace. They could have just said, no, 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 we'll bow down, we'll, you know, we'll turn away from what God wants us to do. No, they chose to trust God and to go forward in faith. And that's how we learn endurance, patience. And then he says, but let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire one of them. So that's what God's doing in allowing trials to come our way. 
He's letting us learn to trust Him. As I've often said, if we never had the opportunity to trust Him, we would never learn to trust Him. It's kind of a simple thing, isn't it? But it's true. So He lets these things happen to have, let us learn to trust Him. Now, when we look at the book of Daniel, we see an interesting description over here um, that describe the one who brings encouragement to Daniel in the later vision. Daniel chapter 10, I want to notice verse 5 and 6. His body was like burl, his face as the appearance of lightning, his eyes as lamps of fire, his arms and his feet like the color of polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of many waters. So he's kind of reaching out for words to describe what he's seeing here. So as he, as he saw Christ uh, clothed in linen, girded with fine gold, So he's got linen, very white, then a gold waistband. <clears throat> Body was like burrow. Burrow. I was looking that up. Uh, it's beryllium and aluminum. One word that can be used is cyclosilicate. <laughs> oh, you got that right? <laughs> and it's a. Um, the pure burrow is colorless, like crystal. So that was the definition came across as. His face has the appearance of lightning. Had to be very bright. So bright can we look up on him. His eyes as lamps of fire. His feet like the color of polished brass. The voice of his words, like the voice of a multitude, so not just one person talking, but a, a certain quality to it when he spoke, like many voices. We're going to look at the same in Revelation. In Revelation, it uses the expression, many waters. So, um, mm -hmm. again, not just a simple voice, but some special quality to his voice. Now, we'll go to John, and let's go to John chapter 1. Verse 13 to 16, we'll see it, the description John's had. Now he's like 500, 600 years later when John wrote Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. This is page 8, 1801. Yeah. Okay, Revelation 1, verse 13 through 16. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to the foot, girded about the path with the golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes were in flame of fire, seeing parallels here, his feet like fine brass, as if they'd been burned in a furnace, his voice the sound of many waters. So you get a similar description. Clothed with the garment, down to the foot. He's got the golden waistband, just like Daniel. Eyes like a flame of fire, same thing. Feet like brass, same description. Voice, in this case, like the sound of many waters, or Daniel, like a moment. So, when, when a prophet gets a vision, they're grasping for words that they're familiar with to describe what they're saying. And, uh, and sometimes it's hard for them to put it in words. And his countenance was as the sun shining in its strength. So a very, very similar description in Daniel and in Revelation. Who is 
the one who appeared to Daniel and John? Well, you saw there, it's the Son of Man. It's Jesus. Jesus, the Son of Man. So Daniel pictures Christ as the mighty deliverer. Now, let's take a little time to look at who Christ is. The Bible predicted the birth of Christ in what place might God? You've got the page there that's uh, 1357. Micah 5 2. And thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall be shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So the Bible predicted Christ would be born where? Bethlehem. There's a lot of uh, interesting teachings connected with the birth of Christ. Remember, there's a picture of like Joseph and Mary making them the boy to Bethlehem. Where were they living when Mary got pregnant? Nazareth? <laughs> and, and it isn't like they said, oh, oh, we gotta hurry and get to Bethlehem. Because this is the Messiah that's going to be born. They didn't understand, you know, they knew what God had promised, what was, but they, you know, it didn't really dawn on them everything that this was all about. You know how God got up to Bethlehem? A tax law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everyone had to go back to their founding city, and Joseph was of the lineage of David, so he got him to Bethlehem. And they just barely made it. He just got in town in time. <laughs> I mean, they couldn't find any place for him to stay, but he, he was born in Bethlehem. I find these kind of stories unique. God will have his way. That's right. Now, it may, it may happen at the last minute. Have you ever found yourself delivered? I'm not sure what that is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll get rid of that. There we go, I think. Go away, go away. <laughs> Aren't those fun? I'll just click. I see the ads. <laughs> it's stubborn though. <sighs> you know, Satan does not like this study tonight. <laughs> I got to, let's see here. Wow. I think I got to, maybe I can disconnect the internet. But if I do that, then I got to start over again. Hopefully, I'll try to remember to disconnect the internet one more because we have an internet here at the church, so it's probably picking it up. So, getting back here to Bethlehem. <laughs> <coughs> Just at the last minute, God got them to Bethlehem. And uh, that's how He do with us sometimes. He just delivers us right at the last minute when it looks hopeless. I got a sermon I call Fourth Watch God. There's four watches in the night. And when the disciples were out in the boat, and it was a storm, and Christ, they left him on shore, and the boat was about to sink, here comes Jesus, walking on the water, and it says it was the fourth watch. Right at the end, hopeless that he comes. So don't give up, keep praying. And something else I find fascinating, remember the wise men coming? And they came from the east, and they brought these very precious gifts couple things. Uh, they didn't know where to find him. So they went to the king, right? They went to Herod. Well, you're the king. Where's, where's this king of the Jews going to be born? You think Herod liked that idea? <laughs> uh-uh. He, so he went to the priests to find out, and they did some study. Oh, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. And, and so Herod sends him and says, okay, uh, go find him and let me know. I'm going to go worship him too. 
Uh, what I find interesting, God even used the enemy to direct the wise men to Jesus' family. And what do they bring? Gifts. And why would they need something, something wealthy like that? Because Herod was going to try to destroy Jesus. And remember God told Joseph in a dream, you got to get out of town. <laughs> well, now they got the gifts and the money to get out. And they went to Egypt. And then once Herod died, they came back. So it's fascinating to see how God works in, in such unique ways and in unexpected ways. And we see that in our life, and we see that in the story of Jesus being born in Bethlehem and God providing for them. How does the Bible describe the one born in Bethlehem? Well, as we saw here, it says he's from old, from everlasting. So Jesus is eternal. And we're going to see a couple more things about him here, from everlasting. Was Christ involved in the creation? Wow, interesting text there. Let's go over there. <clears throat> Colossians 1. Colossians 1. 14 and 15. <clears throat> and 16. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, they, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things are created by him and for him. So, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and earth. So Christ is the creator. He's the creator. And then when we look at the next text here, he says, who was the rock that was the children of Israel, that was with children of Israel as they journeyed out of Egypt into the promised land? 1 Corinthians 16, 10, 1 Corinthians 10. One four. So to the left from where you're at in Colossians. First Corinthians ten one four. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Remember when they came out of Egypt? <coughs> they were coming out. Pharaoh let him go, then Pharaoh changed his mind. Mm -hmm. Then Pharaoh came after him. And now they were trapped. Pharaoh's army behind him, going to kill him. Red Sea in front of him, can't go through the water. And, and God opened up the sea. They went through the sea. That's what he's saying here. He says here, Moreover, brethren, I would not you should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized to Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all did eat of the same spiritual meat. And they did all drink of the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. And who was the rock? The rock was Christ. So in the daytime, Christ provided a cloud to shade them. We know what desert heat's like, right? They were in the desert. So there was the cloud to shade them. And then at nighttime, there was the pillar of fire to give them light. And we find here that was Christ. And then the rock, what was the rock? They were thirsty in the desert. Remember they came to a rock? And they came to it twice. First time in, in Christ told him, strike it. He struck it, and fresh water came out. That was symbolic of Christ being struck, Christ being crucified, and from Christ would come the water of life. And as that fresh water out of the rock provided 
life. I mean, they could live in the desert without water. And Christ is the water of life. There's a lot of symbolism here. You remember what happened the second time they went to the rock? They were on the desert morning around and went to the rock. Christ told him, speak to the rock. But what did Moses do? He got angry. Struck it again. You lost the symbolism. How many times was Christ crucified? Once. And so the symbolism was lost, and God wasn't too happy with that. God, you know, the higher we're up in knowledge of God, relationship with God, responsibility for God, the more responsible we are to represent God in the right way. And Moses, my, God, God said there was none like Moses. I mean, he spoke face to face with God. Um, amazing relationship with God. And when he struck the rock the second time, God said, Moses, you're not going to go into the promised land. That would be very tragic. But you, you find um, from over in, in Jude, Moses died before they went. God showed him the promised land, you know, the mountain. And Moses, it actually says, he, he wasn't sick, he wasn't weak. His vision was clear. He just laid down and went to sleep. But we have an indication he was resurrected. So uh, I don't know how long he was in the grave, but he was resurrected. Uh, he's in heaven now, according to the Bible indicates. So Christ was a rock. A lot of symbolism there. And by the way, all through the Bible, Christ is the rock. Old Testament, New Testament. That's important, by the way, in some of the things we discuss. Christ is the rock. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, what did Christ do for us? 1 Corinthians 15, 3, or we're in 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. So Christ died for our sins. Isaiah 53, we don't read that tonight. Beautiful chapter on what Christ would do for us, written in the Old Testament. And when he died on the cross, he wasn't dying for his sins. He had none. Our sins were being placed on him. And because of our sins, he died. So now let's look at the, some more text here, Christ being fully God. Let's go to John 1, page 1546. John 1, 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And then verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Father full of grace and truth. So one of the terms used to describe Christ. Is the word. Because it says here the word was made flesh became human. And so he's talking about Christ. Everywhere you see the word word, <laughs> you can put Christ in here. In the beginning was the word was Christ. And the word Christ was with God and Christ was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. We saw that already, right? In a couple of questions back. So he's our creator. The world was made by the word of God. <laughs> and the word came flesh and dwelt among us. You know, one of our <clears throat> principles we saw before is that every scripture is Christ-centered. And when it says the word dwelt among us, I remember in the Old Testament when God had him out in the wilderness, he said, make me a tabernacle that I can dwell with you. 
Well, this expression here in verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, if you look at the Greek, tabernacled with us. So it's actually alluding back to the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Testament tabernacle where God dwelt was symbolic of Christ. And when Christ came, he came and he is, was his temple. That's why I said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Well, he was the embodiment of the temple of God. Everything in the temple that pointed, pointed to Jesus. And so there's there's so much in some of these verses that, that really connect with Christ in so many ways. So the Word was God. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now, it's kind of hard to imagine, I would guess. Here, say, put yourself back then. You're back in Jerusalem, Israel. And here's a man named Jesus walking. And he's claiming to be God. That had to be a little mind-boggling. But through the Holy Spirit and those that were willing to yield, their eyes were open to the truth. That yes, this is God. God become one of us, human. Now, we're going to look at the word blasphemy. Uh, let's go to John 8, 15, 59. Not everybody accepted that, of course. John 8, 58. Jesus said to them, Verily, verily I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. That's not bad English, that's an expression. <laughs> Jesus claimed to be the I am. Now remember in the Old Testament, and you've got the text here in Exodus, when God revealed himself to Moses, he said, Who am I going to say your name is when I go to Israel and Egypt? Who do I tell him to send me? He said, Tell him I am. So that was the name of God in the Old Testament. One of the names. I am. And here Jesus is saying, before Abraham was, I am. I am the I am of the Old Testament. I am the God of the Old Testament. Now the Jewish leaders knew what he was claiming. Notice verse 59. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself, so he went, and they weren't able to um, to kill him. But why were they going to kill him? He was blaspheming. Anybody who would claim to be God would be blaspheming God. To, to blaspheme God is to take the prerogatives of God. God's got many prerogatives. <laughs> to take the prerogatives of God, that, that is a, a blasphemy. Um, Another time he was accused of blasphemy because he forgave a man's sins. Well, can Jesus forgive sin? Yes. Yeah. He, he died for them. <laughs> of course he can forgive our sins. Do I have the power to forgive your sins? No. I can direct you to Jesus <laughs> and reassure you, hey, ask for forgiveness. You've got forgiveness, but I, can't. I don't have the power to. See, So it's taking God's prerogatives uh, that's a blasphemy. And that's when you get to Webster's Dictionary. It points it out here. Uh, an act, the underlying part, bless me, act of claiming the attributes or prerogatives of deity. So that, that's by definition what blasphemy is, claiming to be God, or when Christ claimed to forgive sins, the accused of blasphemy again, um, but he could do that. Now, was Christ also man? Well, let's go over that, that's important. Uh, let's go to um, Hebrews chapter 2. He says, For as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same 
that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage, for verily he took on him, not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be the merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of his people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. So, what about Christ? As the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also likewise partook of the same. To be made like unto his brother. Christ is fully God and fully man. When he came to this earth and he became human, he was still divine, but he laid aside his divinity in that he could not use it for his own benefit if he was going to live like us. See, he had to overcome all temptation for us because we sinned. He had to be perfectly righteous. Like right after he was filled with the Spirit, the Spirit led him off in the wilderness. Remember his temptation? The devil said, if you be the Son of God, you know, make these stones into bread. Could he make stones into bread? Of course he could. If you and I lose our job and we're tempted to be unfaithful to God in some way, to make money, should we do that? Well, Jesus had to trust his father for bread, just like you and me, you see. He couldn't use his divine power for himself. Whenever he was tempted, he had to trust his father, trust the Holy Spirit that was living in him to have the victory, just like you and me. So he lived exactly like we lived. That was very, very important uh, for him to live like us and get the victory like us. Does Christ understand humanity? He most certainly does. <laughs> if you go to Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. four, fifteen, and 16. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So, we don't have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He understands us. He lived like one of us. He went through the temptations, trials, and difficulties that we go through. So he can be touched. He knows what we feel. How many members of the Godhead yeah. This is when Christ gave the great gospel commission and he told them to go out and baptize. Matthew 28, 19. He said, Go, you therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. So there's three. Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. Now, as we move into the, um, we've been seeing the Deliverer. Now we're going to see the enemy. Uh, uh, Satan, the one who opposes Christ. What are the names that Scripture gives to the one who opposes uh, Christ. I'm going to move along here. You might have had a chance to look them up. If you haven't, you will. I'm going to be sure we get out for a late time. Um, as we look at these scriptures, we find he's called Lucifer. He's called the dragon, the serpent, the devil, Satan, number of words are used to refer to him. 
And in question 18, under the symbolism of the king of Tyre, God described the creation of Lucifer. And these are fascinating texts. If you haven't read them, I invite you to turn to them later on and read them. Ezekiel 28 here gives you quite a description of, uh, of Lucifer. And it tells you what his problem was. He says, you, you was perfect in all that way from the day you were created. So God made Lucifer perfect. Perfect being. Nothing was sinful about him. But he had a free will. He wasn't a robot. And so he could choose to start thinking thoughts against God. And you know the story he did, it's sad to say. What did Lucifer attempt to do in heaven? This Isaiah 14 text. Um, let's go ahead and um, look at that one. And it really shows that what was going on there. Page 1041. Isaiah 14, 13. He says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation of the sides of the north. Notice verse 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So he wanted to ascend pride, self-exaltation. Exalt his throne above the stars of God. The stars symbolic of the angels. Above everything. Even, as he said here in this other verse, um, 14, I will send above the heights the clouds. I will be like the Most High. He wanted to be equal to God. Amazing. I will sit also on the mount, congregation, the side to the north. Basically, for God's classroom. As a result of Lucifer's rebellion, what happened to him? Well, there's war in heaven, great conflict, and Satan was cast out into the earth. Cast out into the earth. Since Lucifer was cast out of heaven, whom does he seek to deceive? I think you know that answer. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. <laughs> yes, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. He tries to attack us. <coughs> he wants to keep us away from God. He wants us to be lost. Misery likes company, you know what I'm saying? He's pretty miserable. And he'd like for all of us to be with him. <laughs> How does Satan deceive people? This is an important text. Um, I'm filling in the blanks there. He appears as an angel of light. Satan will appear as Christ on this earth just before Jesus returns. That will be really about his last great deception. And angels of light... Um, <coughs> You ever hear about apparitions? You know, some apparition appears like an angel's life. Right? People bow down to them. Uh, let me give you one verse on that. Revelation 19. Just knowing this one verse could really help shield people from a lot of things. Revelation 19, 10. An angel appeared to John. Revelation 19.10 And I fell at his feet to worship him. You ever hear about apparitions appearing? And people falling down to worship him? He said unto me, See thou do it not. <laughs> it's a holy angel. Uh-uh. Don't bow down to me. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testament of Jesus. Worship God. For the testament of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy. 
So here's a holy angel that says, do not bow down to me. I'm like you. I'm a created being. Worship God. Don't worship a created being. So, Satan can appear as these beings. I have one of those angels. If people just knew that one verse, imagine how protected so many people all over the world would be if some apparition appeared to them. I don't care how beautiful it is, and I don't care how wonderful it talks. If it lets you bow down to it, what's it telling you? It's not a holy angel. It's on the other side. Because a holy angel will not let you bow down to worship it. We are never to worship anything but God. Amen. That's where worship is. And by the way, that's another evidence that Christ was God because I won't take you to the verses, but there are numerous places in the gospel where individuals worshipped him and he never rebuked them. Why? He's God. <laughs> See? So, they're, they're very important, but Satan will do that. And also, his ministers appear as ministers of righteousness. Look good, sound good. That's why you must know what the Word of God teaches. This is your and my only protection is the Word of God. Can Satan really work miracles? <clears throat> of course he can. <laughs> They're the spirits of devils working miracles. He can most certainly work miracles. There are true miracles. Don't reject all miracles, but you want to test them. You know, what's the proof? What's, what's going on here? So there are true miracles. But there are false miracles too. Never allow miracles to be the proof that what the individual is teaching is true. No. Let this be the proof. Because Satan will work miracles and he will use the word to mix error with it to deceive. So never let miracles be your, your proof that something's of God. How effective are Satan's deceptions? Pretty good. <laughs> If it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. But praise God, if you stay close to Him, you will not be deceived. You, will be protected. you got nothing to fear. God's with you. With whom does Satan wage war in the last days? Well, it says here, he, he's angry with the remnant, the last people, God's last people on earth, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So that's who Satan is especially angry with. He's called the lawless one in the New Testament. He hates God's commandments. That's what he didn't want in heaven. You know, he didn't want to be bound by any laws. And he tells people that today. But what if, uh, what if everybody in Surprise, Arizona kept the Ten Commandments? You could walk up, leave your house open, your car open, you could leave your wallet on your dash of your car with it. It'd be a pretty good place to live, wouldn't it? So you see, actually obeying God's Ten Commandments brings freedom to everybody. But the, the less obedience commandments, the more you wall yourself in. Yeah. So Satan hates God's last people God's people on earth at the end time keeping the commandments. With whom do God's people have to contend in the battle of life? We looked at that text. It says, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So that's a conflict going on behind the scenes. <coughs> against the rulers of the darkness. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. How can the Christian resist the adversary? Pretty important question. Put on the whole armor of God. Armor of God. Now Paul, he's familiar with Roman soldiers. That was a soldier of his day. So he describes the Roman soldier and the different parts of the Roman soldier's attire. And what is some of that? What is this armor? Well, Lloyd's girt with the truth. Very important. God's truth. You must know it. 
is, is protection for you. God's truth is our shield and buckle of hope. Breastplate of righteousness, Christ's righteousness. Come with Christ's righteousness. If Satan attacks you and he says you aren't forgiven and you've asked God to forgive you, you're, you're forgiven and you have Christ's righteousness. See, that's the breastplate of righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness you have. So, so when God looks at you, he sees righteousness, perfect righteousness of Christ. Feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel brings peace between God and man, and man and man, when mankind accepts it. Shield of faith. It says to quench the fiery darts of the devils. You want a big shield or a little field of shield? <laughs> I want a shield I can hide behind. That's faith. So God lets you go through experiences of life to get your shield bigger, 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 bigger. So you have big faith, big shield. Helmet of salvation, protect your head. Satan will try to tell you you're lost, you're not forgiven. Protect your head. <laughs> you are forgiven when you have Jesus Christ. You have salvation. Don't let him get in your head and confuse you. Sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is a very important one, too. Sword. This is the only offensive weapon. Right? Everything else is defensive. This is offensive. But you got to know something about this. You, you see the word in red, <laughs> the word word, <laughs> Word of God. There are two words in the Greek, translated word. In English. One is logos. That's the written word. The other Greek word is rhema. Spoken word. This is rhema. Spoken word. That's your sword. How did Jesus fight the devil in the wilderness? When the devil came at him with a temptation, what did he do? Spoke the word. Man shall not live by bread alone, right? But every word came the mouth of God. Spoke the word. That, that is your sword. So if Satan comes along to you and says, you're not forgiven, well, there's a promise that says, if I confess my sins, he's never just forgive me my sins. Okay? Speak it. And believe it. When you speak the word of God in faith, it will be a reality in your life. So, Spoken word, remember that, very important. That's how you combat. Don't argue with the devil. Don't do anything. Speak the word of God against them. And believe it, and then move on and get about your business. And you wish to align yourself with Jesus Christ and triumph with God's people. And Christ ends great controversy. I think we do. Okay? I've got you got your little cards there. I want you to put a number one and circle it. Is it your desire to have a deep personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Now you don't have a box to check, but put down a number one and circle it. That little card you got with your name on it. We want you to leave those here. Number two, put a two with a circle. Do you wish to have prayer for you? Um, that you would not be deceived by Satan. It's more, Paul talks about praying for one another. That God will help you to test everything by the word of God. Put a two with a little circle around it. And we've got a, a brief review here. So what have we learned from this lesson? First, the great controversy is going on between Christ, Christ and Satan, between good and evil. God's people will be delivered. God does not prevent bad things from happening to his people, but he goes through trials with us. Christ is fully God and fully man. Satan mixes a little air with a lot of truth. Miracles are not a test for truth. Our only defense against the devil and sin is a firm trust in Jesus. And that will be our next lesson.
So do we have um, the lessons? Okay, uh, Patty and Barbara will be passing out the lesson for next time. You're the first class of the week, so you're going to get one. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Uh, and then we'll, after the lessons are out, we'll close with prayer.